So I just want to welcome back Dr. Paul Offit. He is a pediatric infectious disease legend, um, vaccinologist, writes books about vaccines, complement during alternative medicine. He was on my show early last week talking about coronavirus and everything has changed. I mean, <laughs> everything keeps changing every day, I feel like. So eventually we'll have this figured out. But I wanted to have Dr. Offit back on to give us an update on coronavirus and what it means for parents and families in particular. Dr. Offit, if you could kind of just start and, and share with us a little bit about what's been going on in the past day or past few days that, that you have seen and, and what we can expect in the days to come. Right, so it is, it is Tuesday, March 17th. Um, as of at least this morning, there were 87 deaths secondary to this COVID-19 infection and thousands of cases. Um, I think you can expect things to get worse before they get better. Okay. Um, there, there are some, there is some good news in all this. Um, you, you know who the target population is. I mean, if the goal okay. is to try and prevent deaths, and that's the goal, you know that it's more likely to be someone over 65 who has comorbidities okay. like hypertension or chronic lung or heart disease. So you can then aim for that group. I and mean, so here's what I would say. I think that the most sensible thing to do is if you're an older person, stay home, at least for the next couple weeks, if you can. Gotcha. Um, limit your, 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 and your, the degree to which you interact with people in any sort of crowd. Um, don't visit nursing homes. I mean, cause obviously that's a vulnerable population. I'm sure they will severely restrict anybody who goes into those homes. Right. Um, so, and, and limit your exposure to your grandchildren or children because you don't want to potentially come into to contact with that. So, so that's, that's number one. Number two, okay. I think if, if you are sick, even mildly sick, stay home. Um, and and, and um, wash your hands frequently because I think there's a fomite component to this. And that's what I would say. I, I, I do worry that we may, in our attempt to make sure that we get as little spread as possible, do some collateral damage. I mean, by completely okay. shutting down the way that we live our life in this country. I mean, they, right. the you know businesses are closed. People aren't going to be getting a paycheck home, who typically live paycheck to paycheck, you wonder whether we're going to increase the number of people who are homeless. You wonder the degree right. which we're causing anxiety-related medical problems. You wonder the degree which in the, the, the attempt to get people to recognize the seriousness of this, which I think we've accomplished, by the way, um, that you, you know that you're going to have a lot of people coming to the hospital, the hospital's emergency department asking for testing to be done, which could right. be more difficult for those who really need emergency services to get them. So I just worry that there's been some collateral damage by doing this in um, as draconian as a manner that we've done it. But I guess we'll see. And we'll, I think, only learn that in retrospect. Well, it sounds like what you're saying is that we have to find this balance between the anxiety producing, business closing, fear of your neighbor and the people around you versus protecting those that are at greatest risk and allowing others to move about similar to our, our previous way of life, you know, a week and a half ago. And I, I think you're right. I think that there's this balance that we have to find because it's very easy to get swept up in this and read the news all the time and feel like, gosh, things are exploding. I've seen, I've seen a lot of comparisons to Italy. What, what's your take on the, the, are we lagging behind and on a similar course to the, the devastation that has been shared on the news in Italy? Or do you think the United States will take a different course? Obviously, it's just predictions at this point, but what's your take on that? I think we'll take a different course. I mean, if you look at Italy versus uh, um, France versus uh, South Korea, those three countries have something in common. They're all roughly the same size. They're all mm -hmm. about 60 million people. Yet the um, outbreak in Italy is far worse than the other two. Why? I think two reasons. One is that about 25% of their population is over 65 years of age as compared okay. to 65, 16% with us. So 25% there, 16% here. Two, if you look at the outbreak, it's really primarily in northern Italy, sort of in the area around Milan, not southern Italy, in the area around Rome. It's mm -hmm. a rural country. And so there isn't really the healthcare system 
infrastructure in place to have a lot of intensive care um, in those in that northern region. So I think that also is part of it. So I think it's a different healthcare system in what is largely a rural country in northern Italy, and I think they're an older population. So I don't I don't think what's happening in Italy is going to be comparable to what's happening here. Well, that's a relief to hear because I think that's been something where I've seen lots of graphs on social media comparing even the day by day number of cases and deaths and everything like that and showing that on how, how on par that is. But but you're certainly right that there's a huge different scope. And even when it's 257 deaths on day 14 in Italy and 263 deaths um, in the U.S., well, the bottom number is a lot different in terms of the size of the population affected, too. So that that probably speaks to the way that those social media graphics and that presentation can really bring out that anxiety when in reality it's it's less severe and hopefully will remain that way compared to other countries that have dealt with this and and like especially Italy, which I think everyone fears is, is how things will go. What about children in general? What have we learned in the past two weeks about children and coronavirus? Well, children seem to be relatively less likely to get severe disease. That was certainly true in China. It seems to be true here too. They have more likely to have asymptomatic or mild infection. So that's reassuring. And okay. you know, you could argue actually that when we close schools, for example, that's really not a CDC recommendation. Um, the CDC recommendation here, as I could tell, was that if someone in school is, obviously you shouldn't send your child to school if they have any symptoms. If someone in school is found to have been infected with this virus, then shut down that classroom for a day or two, you know, wipe everything down because okay. there does seem to be a fomite component to this. Um, and then bring school back again. Because remember when you're sending all those kids home, they're spending possibly more time with their grandparents. And sure. at some level, That's a good point. Mm -hmm. kids getting infected um, will um, create a, a level of uh, population immunity or herd immunity that in some level will protect those older people among us. Okay, that makes sense. I can see why you would say that, that we shouldn't just keep school closed until we um, get through this or this passes, because that could be a long time from now. And you're right that a lot of times parents rely on grandparents for childcare in, in situations like this, and then you're exposing that more vulnerable population. I hadn't, I hadn't considered that. What do you think about, I mean, I've heard people talk about schools just being closed for the rest of the school year into summer. Do you think that's the right move at this point, or should we just kind of take it on a week-by-week -week basis in terms of school closings? Yeah, I, I just am not really a big fan of school closings. I, I can mm -hmm. see where if you see um, a case or two that, that you sort of shut down that classroom for a day or two, but I don't understand completely closing schools uh, for the rest of the year. I, I don't think that makes sense, nor is it really, near as I could tell, the CDC recommendation. I think sure, what's happened sure. here is that we don't trust people to stay home when they're sick. We don't. Right. And so what we're doing is we're scaring them to death about the likelihood that this virus is going to kill them in the hopes that that will make, make them stay in their home. And so somewhere in there is the right balance of those two things. But it sounds like what you're saying is probably erring on the side of over worrying and over scaring people about the severity of the illness. Well, which will cause collateral damage. I, I mean, I sure. feel the same way about businesses. You could argue that businesses, for example, that aren't dealing with, uh, you know, the public, I mean, that you're that you're, um, you know, you're just in an office, uh, you know, right. it's, it's just people should be made clear that they can't come in there if they have any sort of mild respiratory illness. Right. And, and that if there is a, a case where it's there to do the same thing you would do in schools there, which is, you know, send everybody home for a day or two, make sure everybody stays healthy. And if they do, you know, just wipe things down and bring them back. I mean, we've, we've shut down the way that we perform business in this country. And, and that means people are going to lose jobs. Some people, sure. many people live paycheck to paycheck. We may increase our rate of homelessness. There'll be a lot of collateral damage from this. And I just wonder whether we couldn't have done this in a more surgical way that would, that would have done less collateral damage. I like that idea of the surgical, protect the most vulnerable, leave everyone else as unscathed as possible um, to, to maintain normal society. Because you're absolutely right, there's a lot of collateral damage. And I talk with parents every day that are just so anxious about it that it's very difficult for them to function. They're not able to engage with their kids. Everyone's anxiety is going to be um, sky high. And, and what kind of damage is that going to do in the long run when we see how, how things played out in months from now? Well, let me um, ask you a question. Do you think as a pediatrician that you are that people are less likely like to come in for well child visits to get their vaccines because they don't want to be around a group of other people? 100%. Yeah, we'll see that. So that would be collateral damage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, on that topic, I wanted to ask you about that is, uh, 
I, a lot of my audience is fellow pediatricians. And so what do you think the general pediatrician in primary care should be doing um, in terms of those well visits, say? Should we just business as usual? Should we try and push unnecessary well checks, you know, for summer sports physicals and everything back further into the summer or just continue on the normal course? What we've done in our office is decided we're going to continue 12 months and under so that we can get that first set of vaccines in the vaccine series um, and then try and push those other older kids well visits that don't have acute issues off at least in for a couple of weeks and see how things play out. What would you do? Yeah, I think that um, that makes sense. I certainly want to make sure that people get vaccines because I think when sure. they start to miss them, it's often hard to catch up with them. Uh, hepatitis right. B example is perfect, right? Mm -hmm. If you get that vaccine in the first few days of life, you're much more likely to complete the series if you don't. So right. you want to make sure people don't get off schedule. <coughs> right. And I think that was one we had talked about, you know, what's the right age? Well, at least if we keep them on schedule through 12 months of age, they'll get their MMR, they'll get their chicken pox, they'll get those vaccines. And then if we need to push it down the road, there's already three months between the 12 and the 15 month visit. So if we have to move that a couple of weeks, it's going to let, do less damage to staying on track for vaccines. Any other thoughts on um, keeping kids coming into the office for sick visits, um, but protecting them? Is that something that we really need to be cautious of and have parents keep the sick kids in the car and call them in one at a time? waiting room. There's so many different facets. What would you do if you were running a general pediatrics office? Nothing differently than I, than I wouldn't do for influenza in the winter months. I mean, okay. think about it. We have, how many children have died so far this year of influenza? Around right. 150. How many children right. have died so far this year of COVID-19? Zero. So, mm -hmm. I mean, although it's true that you're probably more likely as an older person who has comorbidities to die of COVID-19 than if you're infected with influenza, you're still far more likely to get infected with influenza. Therefore, you're more likely to die from influenza. So I think maybe this will make us better in the future about how we handle sort of our respiratory practices during winter months. But I still think we should handle it no differently than we do in any winter. I think that's great advice. And I think that will put a lot of fellow pediatricians listening to this at ease and just kind of, it helps to reframe it because it's hard not to get swept up in the, the hysteria of coronavirus. And, and, you know, you're walking through the grocery store and somebody coughs and you jump back to get away from them or something like that. And we don't even have it in our community as far as we know yet. Um, so I think that just trying to keep that in mind will help to calm people down. I, I will be curious to see how, vaccination rates, influenza in particular, change in the coming years based on how responsive everyone has been to coronavirus. Do you think that, do you think that people will be more likely to get influenza vaccine after go, going through this pandemic and seeing what it would be like to be exposed to this infectious agent? Um, you would hope so. I, I just think the uh, influenza People are comfortable with influenza. They just don't, they don't fear influenza. It, maybe it's the word, you know, comes from the Italian influenza, which just means influence. Maybe if we gave it a scarier name, that would help. <laughs> I mean, I've had people call me and say, you know, well, what about just like the common influenza as if that's no big deal? I, you know, the current right. estimates are about, I think, well, I think I wrote that out here, about 300,000 to 500,000 hospitalizations from influenza so far this year and between 20 and 50,000 deaths. Somehow that's all okay. Like, right. it's okay to die from influenza. It's not okay to die from COVID-19. It's actually not okay to die from either. I just think we should, in some ways, handle them similarly. Oh, one thing I would say, though, it, it, it's, um, it, it is, you can stop COVID-19. I, I think that's the interesting thing. I, I don't think, really, that you could stop influenza with, with mm -hmm. quarantine. I mean, you shed a lot of virus in the upper respiratory tract a day or two before you're sick. There's no stopping that. Um, and the, the, the instance of influenza really hasn't dramatically changed since we've done all this sort of social um, quarantining and true quarantining, uh, because there is no stopping it. Um, this, mm. uh, this virus you can stop. And I think they stopped it in China. They've largely stopped it in South Korea. Why? And I think the reason is, is that there is a, a fecal oral component to this that is not trivial. That's why I think the hand washing works. The, and right. That's, the that's hand washing is huge. I think the, the fomite sort of thing works. because. Sure. This acts in many ways like norovirus. I mean, what, what does norovirus sure. do? It causes regional outbreaks. It causes mm -hmm. outbreaks on cruise ships. It causes outbreaks on, in, in nursing homes. I mean, that's a lot of what you're seeing here with this. I mean, it, in many ways, in some ways, it reminds me of polio, actually, which would cause, mm. you know, about the, the tens of thousands of cases of paralysis every year. But that was just really one one hundred of, of the number of cases of polio out there. That was fecal oral root. And Interesting. Um, so don't, 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 and certainly these kids can shed a virus in their, in their feces. That's clear. The recent JAMA paper just showed that. And you don't have to have mm -hmm. diarrhea symptoms to be shedding the virus. So I think that right. is 
part of it. So it is encouraging that I think we can stop it. And, and, and so I think a lot of the measures that we're putting in will help to stop it. I just worry sometimes that the measures might have gone a step too far that's going to cause sure. a degree of collateral damage that is going to really do a lot of harm. Well, that's an interesting way to frame it, too, because you do hear about like the norovirus outbreaks and polio and everything like that in the past. Um, but it didn't become a pandemic like it didn't spread just dramatically across the world every time there was a norovirus outbreak on a cruise ship or something like that. So that is that's an interesting way to to frame it. And, and that gives me a little bit of peace of mind that well, hand washing is important. There's also population immunity in norovirus. There's no population sure. immunity sure. in this virus, which is why it's interesting, though. I mean, do I think that there are millions of people in China and millions of people in China and South Korea that, that are still susceptible to this virus? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. I don't think that, mm -hmm. that everybody's immune. I don't think the reason right. they stopped it was because everybody was immune. I think they stopped it because it is stoppable. Uh, you, you can't right. growth virus, for example, which is an enteric virus, you may be surprised to know, is really transmitted primarily by the respiratory route. That's why mm -hmm. everybody gets it. I mean, you can't find a child anywhere in this world, no matter the state of hygiene in the home or sanitation in the country, that hasn't been infected with rotavirus. By definition, it has to be respiratory spread. And I think you would have trouble stopping rotavirus by doing the kinds of things we're doing. But we are, I think, mm. we'll stop it. and I'm optimistic that we will slow this down in the next few weeks, you'll start to see somewhat of a diminution as we ex exert these measures. And I'm sure we'll look back on this and say, we needed to do all that, but hopefully we'll be open-minded enough to look at different regions or areas to, to, that, that handle this differently to see whether they're really, we really needed to do all these things to stop the spread. I think that you're totally right that in the future, I think we'll, I mean, this has just woken everyone up, it seems like, to more importance of infectious control and vaccination and my hope and maybe as you kind of alluded to we need to rebrand influenza to give it a little bit more oomph that it that it's as bad as it was i feel like everyone h1n1 still strikes fear into your heart just the, that word rather than influenza even though knowing that now h1n1 is is around and um it maybe a rebranding of influenza will help in the end. Now I have one more question for you from a fellow pediatrician. Do you think that there will be coronavirus parties the way there are measles parties and chicken pox parties in the U S or around the world? No, I think people, why not? Because I think, I think that the, the, the public health message has been one that has been so thoroughly good at scaring people about this virus that I think that people see this as a killer. I, I don't, I mean, unlike, Measles or chicken or chicken pox probably is a better example where they, they didn't see ever see that virus as a killer even though it killed seventy five to one hundred people every year many of them were right. healthy children um, I don't think people ever saw that virus that way I think they are scared to death of this virus I think they would get a vaccine even if it wasn't tested against this this particular virus because they're so scared but you know if you look at that H one N one the two thousand nine influenza pandemic which was mild actually in the scheme of things right. I mean, that killed 200,000 people in the world. It killed 12,000 people in our country. The, the, the percentage of people over 65 who died of, of swine flu in our country in 2009 was only 20%. Most of those deaths actually were in healthy young people. So mm -hmm. it's the opposite of what we're seeing here. And, and so there, that should be reassuring to people that you know it's a targeted group and it's a generally older, more infirm group that uh, this virus is going to kill. Well, I am reassured again by talking with you, and I think that a lot of other people will be as well. And we might have to have you on again again another week and give us another talking down from the ledge. But uh, I really appreciate your time, Dr. Offit, and I appreciate all the work that you've done um, as this has all come out. I'm sure that your schedule has been very busy and that you've been talking and talking and talking. So I really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Good luck.